his brothers don't know that he's now that guy. They thought he was dead. And his brothers go to get rations for their family. And Joseph knows it's his brothers, but they don't know it's him. And he says these amazing words. He says, what you have meant for evil, God has used for good to save many people. And that can be the story of every one of our lives. What somebody has meant for evil, God can use for good to save souls. It's really true. So in the own, my own life, in my case, I was born in 1965 at the closing up of Vatican II in uh, New York in Long Island. And I was the oldest of four kids. My parents were very devout, very trusting, because back then it was kind of a different time. And, you know, for whatever reason, uh, God allowed this horrible evil to come into my life. And when I was about 10, 10 years old, I was brutally sexually abused by a priest. And it was tragic, and it's soul crushing, because you don't know how to process this as a kid. And of course, I didn't want to tell anybody, so I just kept it to myself, but I got very angry at God. God and I said, I'm never going back into that church, any church of yours, because how dare one of yours uh, come out against me? Even as a kid, I just was so messed up. So, you're living in the 70s in the Northeast. Um, typically, most kids my age wanted to be, you know, baseball players, firemen, cowboys. You know, they all wanted to grow up to be the typical things, right? And at the time, there was this guy, a rising star in New York, and his name was Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. And I said, no, 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 we'll be part of the Donald's okay, but he's not Jesus. And I thought, I want to be like that guy, because he had power, he had prestige, he had all the shiny, fancy things, and that was kind of my goal. So I knew going off to college was to get myself back into New York City and just carve out a slice of life there. And I did, for whatever reason, God blessed it. And I made a lot of money very quickly, and all the trappings of that lifestyle went with it. And lo and behold, you know, I was renting a house in Southampton one summer, met this beautiful one young lady on the beach, and uh, we got engaged in Paris, big New York wedding, and had a very unusual life, but she was a lawyer, and I'm a banker. Bankers are early morning people. We get up before the graphic one. We're in the office by seven. We're rounding the numbers, doing all the trade, and all that sort of thing. And then I would take clients out to dinner and get home maybe 9, 10 at night. Yes. Lawyers for big corporate law firms, they go in a little later and they work till like two in the morning. And they have cots and beds for them to stay over because they know some of them are only gonna get two or three hours sleep. So we did not see each other awake until the weekend. And we'd usually just hop on a plane to Bermuda, let our hair down, go a little wild for the weekend, jump on a plane Monday morning back to the grind. This is no way to live. So this went on for a few years, and eventually we looked at each other and said, what are we doing here? And she's like, you know, well, I'm, I'm on my partner track. And I was like, well, what about children? And she's like, not on the plan. So we separated, we divorced uh, at the request of my mother. She said, you should really get an annulment because that's a slam dunk. She didn't want kids. And you know, so I wasn't going to church. I really didn't care, but you know, I listened to my mother. So I put the paperwork in and eventually came back and said, yep, stamp my note, which would be important later. So here I am now, I'm living alone, back alone, in you know, my fancy apartment overlooking the South Street Seaport in Brooklyn, and you know, have a great life, fancy cars, Hampton houses in the summer, uh, up in Vermont in the winter and weekends, and all over the world in the summertime. And I'm, I'm very unhappy miserable really and I'm like how can I be miserable I have everything I really wanted why am I not happy and I couldn't fit it, fit, figure it out or put it together at all so about this time uh, I was renting a villa in Amalfi and a friend called me and said I'm, I'm looking to go to a place in Bosnia Herzegovina which I didn't even know where that was. But she said, it's very, it's right across the Adriatic. 
you know, it's like for you it would be so quick. And I said, oh, well, it, you know, it's, if it has the same food and wine as Italy, it's probably going to be fine. <laughs> so I decided I would go. And you know what? It wasn't as easy to get to as I thought. It took about a whole day. And I get there, and right away I'm realizing one of these things doesn't look like the others. And I'm the thing that doesn't fit in. Like everybody's a, quite a bit older. They're all praying. It looks like it got left behind 150 years. <laughs> and they're saying, you're going to stay in this house. These are these people's house. And they gave you their bedroom, and they'll sleep on the floor. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what happens here? Is there a time of warp that you didn't advance? And I said, I'm not staying, but I'm very tired. In the morning, I'll just get a car service out of here, not knowing there was no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day, I wake up, and I am filled with a peace I've never felt. Just never felt it, never had this feeling. And it was coupled with joy and wonder and just all these emotions I've never really had. And all of my anger and rage and shame and, you know, doing this job is high stress, high anger, high stakes, a lot of cocaine at times. You don't feel those emotions, you feel all the bad ones. And suddenly, that this is happening. So I said, wow, if it feels like this to me here, I'm staying. So I knew enough from my early education that I would have to find a priest to go to confession to. So I wander over to the church and outside, I'm scoping for a priest that looks very merciful. <laughs> because it's gonna be like a 22 year confession and it's gonna be pretty salty. And there's this priest outside. I call him Hollywood priest, very attractive man. Big smile, you know, perfect hair. And he's smoking his cigarette and telling jokes to about 10 ladies. And they're all laughing at his jokes. And I said, that's the priest. <laughs> and little did I know, he happens to be a very holy priest. His name's Father Brandon here, and he's one of the Franciscans, and he's very, very holy. But he didn't look so bad at that moment. So I said, hey, Father, can you hear my confession? Of course, sit down with me. And um, he, he kept smoking. And I it was a little off putting to me because I'm like, is this still a sacrament? Because you know, it's a cigarette. And he puts out the cigarette, he's like, I'm sorry. And he hears my 22 year confession and he says, My son, I absolve you of your sins, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then he says, And I think you're going to be a priest. And I said, I think you don't understand English. <laughs> you don't just hear my confession, you would never have said that. And he said, no, no, all things are possible with God. And I said, okay, thanks, gotta go. <laughs> so I did all the things, you know, I climbed the mountain and the, the hill and went to the excursions and I the rosary, uh, several rosaries throughout the day, and, you know, the, the two masses, the morning and then the, the evening mass. And by the time I'm done, I came back and I go back home. So if you've ever been on a pilgrimage, you know, the real work begins when you get home. The pilgrimage is easy, because there's so much grace, how could you mess up? You can't really, it's protected. Now I'm back in, you know, Satan's kingdom, New York, and I had to make huge decisions. I had to cut out people in my life that were bad influences. I needed to start going to church every day. I found this church very close, like right where I live, really, Our Lady of Victory, <laughs> on Chase Manhattan Plaza. Let me tell you something, at the time, nobody lived near this church. So the weekend mass had 15, 20 people. But the daily masses, Monday through Friday, three masses before 9 a.m., three masses between 12 and 1.30, three masses from 5 to 7 p.m. They had nine daily masses. And confession during all those times. So I was like, if I can't go to church here, I'm never going to go church. So I found a way to make it all work, and I'm walking to work to pray the rosary, and then one day this little Monsignor sees me, he's like, I don't know you, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm new, I just came back to the faith after like 22 years. Oh, well, let me hear your story. So I tell him the whole story, he goes, you need a spiritual director. And I said, why? He goes, oh, I can tell, you're going to need help. And I said, okay. So he says to me, the first time we meet, you know, Oh, what are you praying for when you pray? And I said, I just, I pray the, you know, the, the prayers of like the rosary. I don't really ask for anything. So 
specific. He's like, yeah, yeah, you, you should start asking because like, maybe God doesn't want you to do this the rest of your life. I said, so what do I do? He says, just say every day, say, Lord, do you want me to do something different with my life? Then please tell me. I said, that's the prayer? <laughs> I, that's a four second prayer, I can do that every day. And I felt very comfortable saying that prayer and then going about my business. So after a week, I went back and met with him and I said, Nothing came back. I don't have any replies, so I guess I'm going to stay back here. And he said, sit down for a moment. You left God and his church for 22 years and did your thing and ignored him. And then you prayed for one week and he didn't answer you. Is that correct? And I said, well, yeah, when you say it like that, it makes me look stupid. And he said, because you're stupid. You prayed. So I prayed for a month, I prayed for six months, I prayed for a year, I prayed for 18 months. And on November 5th of 2000, a voice said to me after communion, come follow me, audibly. And I turned around to see who it was, and there was nobody sitting near me. And it was the 730 Mass on a Sunday in St. Aidan's Parish in Williston Park, I'll never forget it. And I said, okay, so you are speaking, you, you can speak. I will follow you, I don't know where we're going to go, but I'll follow you. So this begins the journey. And in the midst of this, so what I start doing is I go back to my normal modus operandi, which is I'm going to figure it all out. So I put up spreadsheets in my apartment, <laughs> religious orders, charisms, locations, and most importantly, how many years to be ordained. My first look was with the Legionaries of Christ. And I even went up to visit them. And I had a big beard at the time. And I walked into the vocation director's office and he goes, you're not called here. They all were very clean cut, like Clark Gable looking guys. And I looked like a wolf man. And he just said, you're not called here. But you can stay the weekend and pray, but no. But in the end, I said, you know what, 12 years. No good, not doing that one. Dominicans, 12 years, no. Jesuits even, 12 years, no. No diocesan, four years. Ha ha, let's start there. So I go down to the local chancery, unannounced. I say, is the vocations director in? Oh, he's actually here today. Yeah, let me just see if he can see you. Yeah, go right in. I walk in. It's the priest that married me. <laughs> that was his reaction. And then he said, no. Everything below Canal got no electricity. They shut it off because they were afraid of explosions. And I'm in a high rise on like 14th floor. No way to get up there. You can't get, it's, it was going to be a desolate situation. There's no way you're going to live in that apartment with all that's going on. So I didn't, now I have no job and I have no home. So I'm really like, wow, this isn't working out like I thought. And a priest comes down from Boston to do a healing mass for the widows. One of my best friends worked at Cantor, and his wife is a friend of mine. She called me and said, will you take me to the Mass for the Widows? I said, of course. And so we go, and after the Mass, the priest said, I want to speak to that guy right there. It was me. And I went over and said, hi, can I help you? And this is what he said to me. He said, what are you doing with your life? Wow, you're so charming. <laughs> Said nothing. I actually have no job and I have no place to live. It's not going great. He said, Well, maybe the Lord's calling you to Boston. Okay, nice to meet you. <laughs> he leaves and I leave. And I said, I'm not going to Boston. He's a wind guy. And about a week later, my mother and father called. How was the mass? I said, It was very beautiful mass. The priest was a little weird, but why was he weird? Oh, he thinks I'm supposed to come to Boston. And my mother is, she. As a way of doing it, well, did you pray about it? <laughs> no, I, I thought it was weird. You better pray about it because you got nothing going on. So I prayed about it. I said, you know what? I'll go up for a weekend. So I drove up for a weekend. I stayed nine months. This priest was the most impactful priest I've ever met before or since. He was living the gospel, not just preaching it. And he was so kind to so many people in so many ways. 
that was his fault, and he was doing practical things, you know? So when he realized that the, the, the downtown homeless weren't getting fed properly, he just said, well, I'm gonna buy chicken and I'm gonna make chicken for them. And I'm like, what? What do you mean you make chicken? So he goes to the grocery and buys like 200 pounds of chicken and gets a whole team of these ladies together. They're baking chicken all day and putting it in little boxes. And then they have these teams on Saturday that go out and distribute all their chicken. And then he would do sandwiches and then the next week would be something else. And he just did what he thought they needed. And then this big snowstorm hit. And the news people were saying, if you go outside, there's really a good chance you'll die. And he comes running down the stairs going, come on, Danny, get your coat, we're going out. And I said, they're saying we could die. <laughs> and he goes, we don't listen to the media. And he jumps in his Jeep, and we go cruising around the neighborhood looking for homeless people. And he just keeps up picking up homeless people, putting them in the church. We did this for hours. And then he went home and made homemade meatballs and spaghetti, fed everybody, brought up the blankets, turned up the heat, and said, don't leave till the storm's over, there'll be breakfast in the morning. And that kind of blew my mind, because I'm like, I didn't know priests could do something practical. I mean, I know this sounds weird, but I thought, I thought you, all you guys do is just pray, or lead prayer. It's like, no, we, we have to, there's no one to save if they're dead, so we gotta keep them alive. And that was kind of how he was doing it in his life, and I was just so amazed by this man. So, right about this time, as you may not know, it's two, you know, 9-11 was 2002, uh, or wine, I forget, wine. So now we've entered two, and the scandal breaks in Boston, in Shanley. Every day, a story of child abuse by priests on the cover of the papers for literally 100 days straight. And this is really triggering me, because the reaction in Boston was very interesting to watch. Half the people, felt bad for the priests and hated the victims, saying they're all liars, they're just trying to steal money. The other half hated the priests. And one day I sat down and I thought, wow, 100% of these people would hate me for one reason or the other. One, because I'm a victim, but two, because I want to be a priest. They would all hate me. <laughs> and then Father, the same thing, like, this is getting crazy. Let's get out of here. You want to go on a vacation? I'm like, I'm always up for a vacation. Let's go. Where are we going? Where are we going? <laughs> Poland. I'm like, Poland? Okay. It's, I've never been to Poland, but okay. It's better than here. So we go. Now, this is an important lesson, this piece right here, about giving God permission with your life. We as Americans tend to cover all our bases. We're very big on insurance policies. And we give God no room to move. Really, you have to give him permission and let him come in and do the things he wants to do. He's a gentleman. He likes to be invited. So we get there, and we rent a car, and Father says this prayer. Lord, we give you permission today to use us in any way you desire and give us the grace to see your hand in action so we can give you all the glory. And I thought, hmm. I guess I didn't learn that prayer because I was away for a long time. But he was really just speaking from his heart. So we get in the car, and we're deep in these black woods of Poland somewhere, and it starts smoking, and more smoke. And I'm driving now, I can't see because of the smoke, so we have to pull over, and we have to call a tow truck. And they bring a big flatbed, and there was only one seat in the cab, so Father sat in the cab. I'm in the car, up on the flatbed. <laughs> all these Polish people are driving by laughing and pointing at me, like, ha ha, look at you. And I'm like, this is not a vacation. What is this? This is crazy. We get to this, when I say one horse town, it had a church, a cemetery, and a gas station. That was it. So Father says, I'm going to the church to pray. You deal with the car. Okay. Church is locked. He goes to the cemetery and kneels down before a statue of Our Lady and says, I'd really like to go inside and have a chat with your son. And with that, somebody comes out of nowhere and says, I have the keys. Would you like me to come into the church? He goes, yeah, I've been waiting for you. They go inside and he starts praying and the Lord says, this priest here is very sick. They haven't had mass for three months and I want you to have mass today for the people. He says, of course, but it'll be in English. So with that, this other person comes up and says, are you a priest? He says, I am. And the Lord told me that your pastor is sick. So gather the town's people and the American at the gas station. We're going to have mass. <laughs> uh, 
So if somebody comes over to me saying, oh, for us to come, we're having mass. And I say, what? We have a crisis with the car. Like, what are you doing? Okay, I'm coming. We have a mass, a beautiful mass. And at the end of mass, he says, take me to your pastor. He hasn't seen anybody in three months. He hasn't come out in three months. He'll see me. This is why God sent us here. We go, knock, knock, knock. Nothing, knock again, nothing. Third time, he says, open the door. I'm here to pray with you. So the door opens, and there before me is a man who looks like he died three months ago. <laughs> and I'm just like, whoa, what's, what's in here? You know, what does he have? Look at him. And he falls back in bed. Father's not amused. So I'm thinking this would be the ideal time probably to use that sacrament for the sick. Yeah? This guy looks like he's beyond sick. No, that's not what Father did. He prays, and then he goes like this. Puts his hands up, and he just starts praising Jesus. Oh, Lord, we give you praise today. And I'm like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> and I realize, I don't really know him that well. And I don't know this guy at all. And I'm like, I'm leaving. I'm going back to the gas station. When I get out of there, I'm not comfortable with that kind of charismaniac prayer. Sorry if that's how you pray. I, I can do it now. At the time, it was out of the question. But... The gas station guy says, I have, we have a big problem. I'm going to have to order a part. It's going to take seven to ten days. I'm like, seven to ten days? That's my whole vacation. And I've just seen your whole town. So I said, no, no, that's it. I said, look, use my FedEx number. He's like, what is FedEx? We don't have FedEx here. He's like, we're in the woods. I'm like, gosh, this is crazy. So I go back. He's still praising the Lord. And then the priest jumps up out of the bed. I think I've been healed. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Lord. Okay, let's get our things. <laughs> Can I make you dinner? And I look at Father Tom, I'm like, no. He hasn't left here in three months. Anything in that fridge is crawling <laughs> with mold and disease. Yes, he loved us there. He made soup. It was dreadful. <laughs> and he starts crying during the meal, saying, we have no locations here in this part of Poland. I feel like the church is dying. Blah, blah, blah. And Father says, well, look, this guy's going to be crazy. <laughs> and if he can be called, anybody can be called. <laughs> and he's so happy, he runs and gets all his relics. He wants to give me his relics. I said, look, I really don't think you have to do that. It's very kind, but I'm okay. No, no, I have my relics back and forth. I said, okay, I'll take them. And then... He's blessing us, and Father's blessing everyone's blessing everybody, and we leave. <laughs> Father says, do you know what happened today? I said, I have no idea. What happened, <laughs> what happened today? He said, well, we prayed that prayer, and God brought us to this parish to heal the priest and have mass with the people so they could be blessed by him. I said, okay, that's great. We get in the car, it starts up. By the way, he, this is what he says to me. I hammered two parts together. And normally if I hear that about a mechanic, I'm like, that's not going to work for my... I mean, I'm driving into a country I don't know. You hammered parts together. I was like, thank you. That's awesome. We start the car, it drives. They never had a problem the rest of the week. We get to a little pension halfway, you know, 20 minutes down the road. We get out of the car. We go to our bedrooms. I say, good night. I'll see you in the morning. We get up in the morning. We get in the car. What does he do? Lord, we give you permission today to do this. <laughs> So we go, and truth be told, on the door of this thing, it, 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 probably five, six, seven languages, has the words, close 364 days a year, open on July 11th, the Feast of Benedict. It's July 11th. <laughs> so I go, let's go. Knock, knock, knock. The door opens. They go, welcome. We're having a feast. Come in. And we have like a two and a half hour lunch from like 4,000 pierogies and every possible Polish dish. <laughs> and all this great sweets and candy they had. And, and, and then they took out all the medals. And the Father Prior blessed the medals with a special prayer on the feast day of Benedict. And they load us up and they put us in the car. We drive away. 
I said, did you see what happened today? I said, kind of, but go ahead and say it. So he says, today we prayed the prayer. Today God wanted to bless us. We were the recipients of the grace today. I go, that was wonderful. Right, let's pray it happens again tomorrow. And every day this would happen all as we're going through this. And then Friday is the final day we're going to see the Black Madonna at, on the Mount of the Special Monastery. We left four hours to get there. It said it would take two, so we really gave ourselves a lot of time. But I got lost. Why? Well, nobody really told us, but during World War II, the Polish put up fake road signs to throw off the Nazis. <laughs> but then after the war, they said, well, we all know what the right way is, so we'll just leave them up. <laughs> well, I didn't know the right way, so I'm following the Nazi way. <laughs> and we get lost, and now we pull up. It's exactly like a minute to three. There's a mob outside the church. I said, forget it, we're never gonna get in there. He goes, well, look, we didn't do anything wrong. We just got lost. God will get us in, don't worry. So I said, okay, fine. So we start heading up this mountain and this, one of the priests of the order there comes running up and says, you know, Tom, is that you? And he's like, yes, it's Father Tom. And they had done a mission together a couple of years earlier. He takes us by the arms and he runs us up the mountain and pushes us through the crowd, into the church, down to the first pew. It had a reserve sign plops us down in the first pew. <laughs> and the whole thing begins. And he kicked me. Father Tom kicked me to let me know he was right. <laughs> I said, you're not as old as people think you are. And that's how the whole week went. So the lesson you well, I took away, which you can all benefit from as well, is when you give the Lord permission to use you in any way he desires, you will always have this front row seat for these miracles. And it's just, it's a new way of living your life. It's an exciting way of living your life. And the other thing is, you gotta tell people so they realize you don't have to be living this life of like gloom and doom and humdrum and all this garbage. You, you can have an exciting life watching God move you through all these corridors he wants to get you in. It's very exciting. So we come back. Um, from there I entered into Holy Apostles to get my philosophy done, because I could do that. They let you come as a free agent, I did that, and then guess who sort of calls me up? New York. Oh, we hear you're in seminary. This is a new vocation director, the other one who moved on. And I said, yeah, but you didn't want me. Yeah. He's like, well, we want you now. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, all right, well, my family's there, it'd be good to be close to them, I'll, I'll switch over, and I went to this seminary. This seminary wasn't great, <laughs> to be honest. It was rough. The men were amazing. The seminarians were amazing. And we actually did a lot more research trying to, to uh, refute the lies that some of the professors were telling us, the heresies, literally. We were using a book condemned by Cardinal Ratzinger of the CDF at the time, a Roger Haight book. They don't condemn a lot of books. Why are we using this for Christology? I don't understand it. But everything was like that. It was a fight in every class just to get through. Two years of this and I had to get out. So I left and I became a contemplative hermit in the woods of Nebraska, of all things. And, yeah, believe me, I was just a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get here? And uh, that was another wild experience in my formation because I was so worldly, it was gonna take more time for me to you know, weed this out of my life. So now I'm entering into radical obedience and radical poverty. And, and chastity is always chastity. You can't get it. It's what it is. It is. But the obedience was at a level I did not know. And I, if I had entered that first, I would have never lasted. I would have left after a day. Like, I'm not doing this. These guys are crazy. Because you give up everything. You have nothing. Two, one, two habits, one set of work clothes, maybe a week's worth of underwear and socks. Bible, rosary, crucifix, that's it. And that's one thing. But then, you know, the if I want to go for a jog after dinner, I have to ask my superior, can I go for a run? And nine times out of ten, yes. But then one time out of ten, no. Why not? Because I said so. Okay, am I four? What kind of answer? I said so. That's like, I'm not a toddler. This is obedience. This is what it is. Ah, okay, that's great. Christmas comes, parents send a big gift of like a fruit basket or chocolate. And they're talking to me about it. Oh, I never saw that. So I turned to my spirit. Did, did something come from my family? Oh, yes, it was beautiful. We gave it to the sisters. 
How does that work? That's how it works. We, we decide where things go. This is a different kind of life, right? Uh, I have five years of that, and then the community started to crumble for weird reasons, and I felt like I was called out of there. In fact, my superior, who was the exorcist of Omaha, said, you gotta, if you want to be ordained, you've got to go now, get out. So I did, and it kind of pushed me back into diocesan life, and I eventually got a phone call from the Bishop of Nashville. He, this beautiful man he said, I want to meet you. I've heard about you. Uh, I'll fly you into Nashville. I'll come pick you up and, and I will we'll, we'll chat. I'm like, okay, but you're going to pick me up? He's like, yeah, is that a problem? I'm like, no, it's just very bizarre for a bishop to pick up a seminarian. You know? He's like, no, this is fine. I'll pick you up. And then he took me to his home. I stayed in his home for a week. And I'm like, who else lives here? He's like, just me. I'm like, I'm going to stay with just you. He's like, is there a problem? I'm like, no, it's just weird. Like, when I was in New York, I met with the bishop for 15 minutes before Christmas a year, and that was it. Like, you're going to take me to your home for a week? He's like, oh, we're different in the South. I'm like, oh, fine. This guy was amazing. He got up early morning and cooked me a homemade breakfast, you know, like biscuits and gravy or fried chicken and waffles. He had me drive in all his appointments all day. At the end of the day, we'd go to dinner or whatever engagement he had, and then at night we'd have a scotch on the porch and talk about everything under the sun. Love, marriage, commitment, sacrifice, celibacy, everything. And after a week, he goes to me, Daniel, I like you. I think you could be a good priest here. Come be a priest for me. I said, okay. And he ordained me. That was it. And then he died about a year later. Oh. That's, yeah, that's the way the wall bounces sometimes, you know, what's his time? But a very holy man. And for him, I was doing deliverance. He knew I was doing that in the prior place. And then the new bishop came in and said, why is all these priests calling me, asking me to send you to help them? I said, oh, I do the deliverance. He goes, are you the exorcist? I go, no, we didn't have an exorcist. Why not? The bishop thought it would be too much of a burden to give to one person. He says, well, I don't see it that way. I feel like you're fighting with your hands and tied behind your bare back. Go to Rome, get trained in exorcism, come back and be the exorcist. So I did. This is how that happened. While all this is happening, there was this horrible, I moved the library of the school from the basement to upstairs. In the process, we went through the books just to weed out the stuff that was old or didn't look right. There was a lot of garbage. Uh, Stephen King books for fifth graders? What? What is this? And Harry Potter. We sifted him out, too. Well, somehow the teacher, one of the teachers didn't like this, and they let it known to the local media that I was censoring books. I wasn't censoring books. I'm the pastor. I get to put in the library only has so much space. You gotta pick what goes in it. Let's get some more lives of the same books instead of Harry. Well, the AP picked it up and it went around the whole world. The bishop was brand new. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he's gonna kill me. And it was so big for four weeks. We got hundreds of phone calls, threat threatening emails, Satanists were sending me satanic bibles and all sorts of Ouija boards and every garbage crap they could find from the mail to my parish. The Viewer did a skit about, oh, I was the hot topic on The View. That's how bad. And Jimmy Kimmel did a skit about me. And he dressed as a priest and had a, re a name tag that said Father Reno. Through this all, the bishop only spoke once. He said, the father is following his canonical duties as the pastor. He has the right to put any book he desires in the school. It is up to him, period. But he was angry underneath. And he let me know that through his subordinates that sat me down and said, this can never happen again. I said, I didn't do anything. I don't understand how I can control something I didn't do. We just were doing the normal thing. So when Radio Maria called me, I said, He's never going to give me a public voice because he's afraid of me getting out there. And the president of Radio Maria said, well, our lady, if she wants it, she'll get it done. I said, yeah, I believe that. Fine. I'll go ask the bishop. I guarantee he's going to be like, oh, hell no. <laughs> I said, bishop, this request came in. Uh, this group wants me to head this up. It's going to take some of my time. So, you know, I have to split my time, blah, blah, blah. He goes, I think it's a good idea. You know, you can't be looking at all that darkness of exorcism all day. You should have something in the light, like Our Lady, to balance it. Go ahead and do it. What? <laughs> what? 
You want me on air every day, five days a week, speaking my mind? <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. And this, this is how these things keep happening, right? So I don't want to go over on the time here. So let me just say, you know, the Lord has not only blessed me, but so many communities through the doors he's put me through and opened these avenues to communicate and get the message out there about what he he really wants. It's the heart, the heart of all these people to be with him, you know? And it's not so complicated. The gospel's not complicated. It's very simple. It's not always easy because we live in an anti-Christ world, but it is simple. Love me, love my people. In that order, you have to love him first because then we get the graces to love the people. I don't know if you've noticed, people are very prickly. It's like having a porcupine sometimes. You know, you got to be delicate. People are broken. People are frightened. People are looking for some kind of mercy in their life. And if you're in a daily routine of prayer and adoration with Jesus, he'll give you the graces to embrace his people. But you have to have those graces. You really do. Now, just a few more quick stories about just in my own life, what's happening with Jadori. My mom wanted to go for years. But she kept saying, I really want to go with my husband. And she'd ask my dad, he'd go, I'm not going. I, don't, I only stay in America. I'm American. I like being in America. <laughs> shut her down, shut her down, shut her down. She starts praying. So one day she hears all these say, just give him to me. And you just pray for my intentions and I'll take care of him. Okay, fine. About a month goes by. Dad walks in the house one day. He says, Gladys, guess what? Fire department's running a trip to that place you want to go to. I put this on the trip. <laughs> Imagine something place. Oh, really? Yeah, so they go. He thinks it's going to be a guy's trip, like bourbon and cigars. <laughs> Turns out these firemen were very devout firemen that wanted to pray and do the adoration. And he's like, oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? He hasn't been to confession in like 40 years. Big problem. He knows he has to go, but he's terrified. And I, God knows why. I think he's making more of this than he should have. But. He's outside the church in the outdoor seats. And it's, it's approaching the time of the apparition. And he puts his head down. He's like, I can't do it. I can't go in. And he puts his head down. And then the bells start ringing. He picks his head up. He's inside a confessional. And he doesn't know how he got there. And it's Father Sven. And Father, he says, how did I get in here? What's going on here? He's very cynical. Father said this, oh, it's fine, my son, let's begin. Name of the Father. <laughs> he does his whole 40 year confession. And when he left the confessional, he said he had a bird's eye view looking over the whole crowd. He was literally in his spirit floating over the people. Now, to know my dad, this is not my dad. He, doesn't, he is so practical, he doesn't talk about anything supernatural. But that day, he knew something happened. And he's been a daily, daily communicant ever since. Praise the rosary one, two, three times a day. He's back 100%. This is years ago. My sister had a girl, baby to firstborn, who was very, very sensitive, very tough, very beautiful girl, but her dad was in a wheelchair since she was born. My sister was engaged to her high school sweetheart, and during the engagement, he was in a car wreck as a cop. He got thrown about 200 feet found him. He was unconscious. He was in a coma for six months. They said, he's gone. Just let him go. And she kept pushing. Don't. Don't do this. If you give him a shot, give him a shot. After six months, he wakes up, but he never walked or talked again. And after another year, she said, well, I've known him before the accident. Now I mean, it's a year after. And he can communicate. He writes with one finger in the air. They both can understand how it works. And she said, so I'm going to marry him. So, well, you know, of course, my parents were like, I don't know, is this smart? You're like 23, uh, you're gonna be a nurse the rest of your life. How can you be, this is, how does this work? So she said, look, if you don't want me to, I'll just get out of the and when nobody has to cry at my wedding. So of course, they're like, no, we'll have a wedding. So they get married, they're still married today. They have three kids, nobody knew they could have any kids. And this oldest one, I guess because she saw and started to realize that this could happen to somebody, that they could be in a wheelchair their whole life. She began controlling her eating and got taken down with anorexia pretty bad. From the eight years old, she's now a 
about 12, and she weighs about 60 something, 63 pounds. And she's dying, she's in a hospital dying. And the doctor says, there's nothing more we can do. And she's, this is the end, she's gonna die. So my sister says, well then, pack her up, we're getting her out of here. The doctor says, well, where are you gonna take her? She goes, I'm gonna take her to Bosnia. Bosnia? <laughs> she won't last the plane ride. Well, that is, that's God's business. Oh no, you can't take her, she's gonna die on the plane. You said she's gonna die in the bed here anyway, so we're going. It's winter, Should we go, she doesn't need anything on the flight. We land, she ate like three grapes and half a cup of water, and she was prayed with by Visca. Visca has the special intention of healing. Nothing changes the whole week. She got anointed by the priest during her, start time, her time there as well. When she landed in New York, she got home in the house, and that day started eating regular meals as though nothing had ever happened. And the doctor said it's impossible. Her stomach isn't capable of eating a full meal. Now she's eating like three meals a day. And after 18 months of this, they pronounced her completely healed. It's gone. She went on, she became a nurse. She now works on the anorexia ward where she was in the back. And she tells the girls, I was lying right there one day. You can overcome this. And let me tell you how you're going to do it. And she tells her story. Amazing, right? Yeah. My brother, New York City fire captain, he was in 9-11. He lived. But he was deeply disturbed. He went to about 100 funerals in four months. They weren't funerals. Though. There was no body. There were memorial services. And he just called me when he said, I can't do this anymore. And I'm like, Brian, it's, it's not normal. Like, the priests don't go to that many funerals probably in their whole life when you just did it four months, so don't go, stop going. And he was raging, he was angry, he was drinking like three bottles of wine a night, and he was just out of control. So he, one day, just my mother said, you know, you could really use a trip to Medjugorje, I'll pay for it if you want to go. He's like, I want to get out of New York, I can't stand New York. So he goes, they arrive, and it's pouring rain, it's lightning out. Know? He goes, I gotta go up that mountain. She's like, but you don't even know how to do it. You've never been here. I'll figure it out. And he goes charging up this mountain in the middle of a lightning storm. <laughs> and if you've ever been there when it rains, the water turns into rivers in the rocks because it's so rocky. And he's standing in these rivers of water coming down the mountain. He's screaming up in heaven, you know, why did you let this happen? Ah. And God says to him, I cried that day too. gets me emotional. Yeah. The rivers of water running down this mountain are come nothing compared to the tears I've cried. He's instantly healed. And he lets his anger go. He comes home, done drinking, back to being a normal guy, completely healed. Completely healed. So like, just in my own family, I have like four or five miracles just from our family. Now, the, one of the funniest ones was when I was in the Connecticut Seminary, back to his last story, don't worry. <laughs> I was always promoting this in the seminary, and these very good religious orders, like Father Groeschel's men were there, the Cantius Fathers of Chicago, great group, they were there. Fathers of Mercy were there. And I'd say, you guys should be going to Magic Boy. And they'd go, oh, no. it's not a group should do that. And I would just look and go, ah, so you only want to go after she's left. What's the fun in that? But this one guy, Rufus, from Canada, young kid, he always was listening. And fast forward, you know, maybe 20 years later, he uh, eventually got ordained for Archdiocese in New York. He's very smart. They sent him to Rome for his doctorate. And he's still a young priest. While he's in Rome, he's also very handsome. He was getting hit on by high level prelates, bishops. Oh. And he got into a severe depression. He said, I can't believe this is still happening. How could this be happening? This is, this is two years ago. And he just said, I don't want to be a priest. I'm done. And he said, I'm, I can't do this. I can't live with, with this going on around me. And he has this thought, maybe you should go to Medjugorje. So he says, you know what? I'm, I have three days off. I'm going to fly there and see if that's real. I'm going to ask my mother to help me through this. So he flies to Medjugorje. Lands, he gets settled, goes right to bed, he's exhausted, wakes up in the morning, same thing I had, total peace, total joy, total happiness, and he starts going, wow, 
this is real. Like, she's really here. She's my mother and she's healing me. He had a complete new zeal for his vocation. And he just starts crying. And he goes, I wish I could find Dan Rehill and tell him this is real. <laughs> and as he's thinking this, I go walking by the path in front of his little hotel, and he sees me. He's like, what? He's like, Rehill, is that you? I go, yeah, who's that? He's like, Rufus. And he comes running at me like a ball, and he's hugging me, and he's crying. And he's oh, you're not going to believe what happened. Ah. And I said, well, you know, only that stuff can happen here. It's insane. It's just that crazy that God can just put things together in such a neat little package. And finally, I went back as a priest after 19 years, my first trip. Took a group of people. They, we went to see the famous uh, statue in uh, Tialina at that church. It's like 20 miles away. And we pull up in the the tour guide goes, wait outside the bus, the pastor wants to greet you. And say, well, okay, fine. So out walks this priest, and I right away I'm like, oh no. <laughs> it's the priest who heard my confession. Now I know who he is because I'll never forget that face because this is the moment I changed my whole life. But I didn't think he remembered. He goes like this. Oh <laughs> you became a priest. <laughs> Biscuits and caught up, he stopped smoking. <laughs> he had a heart attack. Oh. But he's better. And we just we we hugged each other like we were long lost brothers. It was so cool. And again, like only God could pull that all together. So, how do you take this out of here? What do you do with it? The messages are real and they're really simple. Get close to Jesus through his mother. Spread the word of Jesus' message. You don't have to say Medjugorje. Some people get it weirded out by it. But just preach what Jesus told us, you know. Just come back to me. Love me with your whole heart and soul and strength. And then bring me to the world so everybody can know about me. Like, he's the greatest person that ever walked the earth. The kindest, the most gentle, the most powerful. Why do we not like him? I don't understand it. He's the best. And when you tell people about him, they'll be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know why people don't like him. Come and come back and say hello to him and bring them to church. The first step is you got to hook them by taking them with you and then let sit them before the Eucharist for an hour. Their lives will be changed. Their lives will be changed. So last point is the cross. We'll go back to the cross. Some days we have days that everything goes our way and we like those days because that's who we are. We're flawed people. So you wake up in the morning refreshed, rested. You go into the kitchen. Your spouse has made you the perfect breakfast. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Perfect breakfast. You get in your car. It's all green lights to work. You get to work. Boss wants to give you a raise because you're doing such a great job. You come home. Perfect dinner is on the table. The kids are, we love you. And it's just the greatest day, right? And that's the days that God gives you the grace to enjoy the day. And those are good days. They don't happen a lot, but they're there. But then some days you wake up exhausted and the alarm did go off and you stub your toe trying to get to the bathroom and there's no hot water for the shower and you're late for work, you have a flat tire, the boss wants to fire, everything's falling apart. Yes. Those are the days when he's giving you the grace to endure the day. But those are the days that you have more to unite to the cross to go rescue souls, right? Yes. So you have to be looking through life through a new lens, the new lens of Jesus. And Paul said this, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may know what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. If you start looking at life this way, every day is going to be a great day. Because that day you have so much to unite to Jesus, and together you'll go help save souls. So here's the big takeaway. If you can think like that, if you can transform your mind to think that way, there are no more good days or bad days. 